Hey, this is Glendon Cameron with the first video in disruptive life coaching. That is an exercise. This is going to be probably some of the craziest stuff that you've ever seen, heard, and you, you're the only people that's going to get this. There's only a handful of you right now. This will never be made mainstream because it's going to be very close, up close, very personal, crazy stuff. Just crazy stuff. It will give you some insights to what's wrong with me. <laughs> Hence the name Disruptive Life Coaching. The reason that I came up with that name is I believe in disruption. I believe that it's going to come in your life in a manner of two ways, intentionally or unintentionally. But either way, it's coming. So first part of my life, it was disrupted by divorce, layoffs, and the personal crisis of me dealing with losing my family. I was a little nutty for about three years. And it completely eradicated, regurgitated many things that I was brought up with to believe to be true. And I saw up close in a very ugly light of harsh reality that those things were not true. I had to deal with them or go crazy. And dealt with them, I did. And I started doing things that many people thought were crazy, like job hopping. But I wasn't job hopping. I was specifically gaining skill sets for my personal satisfaction and gain and moving on to another level to get some more skill sets because I realized maybe subconsciously that the problem I had wasn't a lack of intelligence. It wasn't a lack of people not liking me. It was an information gap. I had a massive information gap on the personal level, the technical level, and the financial level. Fiscal education alone, if you have a very good one, whether you have a college degree or you're a high school dropout, if you have a strong fiscal education, you can become a billionaire. We see it. And many people don't understand it because they have narratives and things that are written that their life should be this way and they will not disrupt those narratives. Therefore, they will not open their minds or their lives to the possibilities of things that can come in. So let's just get into it. Once again, this is not going to be for the faint of heart. <laughs> this is not going to be for those who are a little namby pamby. It's going to be rough, rugged and raw. The first part, and I should let you know, because if you're here, you're also a member of the Advanced Conservative Hustler Mindset Training and Hustler University. What's going to happen here is you'll get all of that, plus you're going to get the extra, the Z factor, the X factor. You're going to get some stuff that I just don't talk about now. We'll never talk about it on YouTube. You'll get that here. You'll get processes, methodologies that I used and developed over years to help me handle crisis because I was in a lot of crisis and it was due to poor decisions. But I learned how to handle a lot of pressure, a lot of stress, and a lot of beautiful things started to happen when I started to calm down. When you have stuff that's coming at you and your life is in a storm, it is remarkably hard to stay calm because our natural inclination is to lose it, to become mad, to become stressed, to become drugged with worry. I was in so many situations that if I didn't become numb and start looking at the things that were happening to me in a clinical manner, I would be insane right now. I'll give you one. I was, this happened during the... I'm going to call them the years of enlightenment when everything was regurgitated, when my life was shot up in the air, turned upside down. I was held by the pants to drop naked in the street. That's how I felt. I learned to adapt, I separated from the wife, was going through a divorce, and I didn't have any money. I had screwed up, lost my job because I had acted out at work. So I couldn't use the best reference I had as a reference. 
I tried and they were like, oh, we got a bad. I mean, someone just told me it's like, I don't know what you did, but this they, they were like, it wasn't good. And I had to submit to minimum wage jobs, bullshit jobs, shitty jobs, working in landfills on the roof of hot buildings with tar. I mean, it was crazy. In the midst of all this, I still got lonely and I started dating this girl. Pretty girl, beautiful girl. I actually kind of like, why are you with me? And then later on, I figured it out. Why? Because this girl that I was madly in love with, I was dating. Her name is Lucy. She had a degree from Dillard University in English Lit. Was a crackhead and a prostitute. And talk about my mind was blown. I was in such a state of disruption in my life because the prior me, the one that worked at North Sun Hospital, the clean guy, the guy who was very judgmental, would have never even considered the things I said when she told me about her life. I said, well, we can get you clean. (laughs) Later on, after she left, I started the fears came in. Do I have HIV? So like that day, I went to the HIV clinic and had a test and I had tests done like for three months and I was clean because, yes, I was having sex with a crackhead who was a prostitute without a condom. How's that for fear? So I go through all that. And even with all that, I didn't leave her. You know, I I tried to save her and you just can't save a crackhead. A crackhead must save themselves. So I tell you these things that I went through, not as like, oh, you know, poor. No, I mean, it, it was a good experience because in the middle of some crazy shit, I still had empathy. I had a lot of empathy for it. And, you know, if she wasn't who she was in terms of the drug use, I probably would have married her. So. We lost contact and I saw her maybe 15 years after that day and she would just waste the way and become nothing. But I knew who she was and it, it just literally broke my heart. But that is what I went through. And, you know, let's talk about prostitute. I'm living in the boarding house. I am living this crazy, crazy freaking life. And I found joy. And this is what I'm on. This is how I found joy. So I will read these to you and I will give you some more. When I say that I had to deal with every fear, you know, heartbreak, divorce. Uh, when I worked in Northside Hospital, I walked in a room, collected some samples. Later on, I came back shift. I saw the person was in isolation for. It was uh, not the measles. It was malaria. That's it. The person had been in India and had contracted malaria. And I was in the room unexposed. And we at the time had a newborn child. So I'm sitting on the back figuring I had contaminated my child. That's some serious fear. We went through that. Everything was cool. But I'm your personal lab rat. I don't have the high level. I have a very high level for risk. An extremely high level for risk. And with that high level of risk, I've gotten myself in many, many tricky, crazy, over-the-top situations. So what I'm giving you is hard-won advice and experience. It's um, it's kind of crazy because before I got sick, I never would have talked about this stuff. Very few people even know about these things because it's just crazy. It is over-the-top crazy. But in... Disruptive life coaching. I'm going to share this stuff with you because my life was disrupted. And when I was going through it, it was horrible. It was it was a nightmare. It was just literally crazy. And if I didn't go through that stuff way back then, I wouldn't be the person that I am today. And it's a really dicey proposition when you say, well, if you go back and change anything, because if you change, I mean, I don't know if I could change anything and still come out the way that I am. And I'm very happy with where I'm at the person I am now. I don't, I mean, it would be like, if I had the option, I would have to say, no, I'm not changing anything because I can go back and try to remove some of the pain and make it easy. And I could totally screw up my life plan because right now it is crazy. Good, crazy. Good. So just some things that you want now in dealing with my fears, I had to admit some stuff Some not really cozy stuff. I had to realize that 
I was living in a boarding house. I was homeless for a little while, living in my car, living in the boarding house due to massive poor decisions. That's that's what it was. I made some massive decisions. It would be real easy to say that my ex-wife was crazy and she did. That's not that wouldn't be true. I picked the wrong woman. I knew there was some stuff there, but I loved her. And I didn't really understand until later that you can love someone and you can have a person, you can be a person with outrageously good values. And if you marry a person who doesn't share that at the core, it's usually going to be a catastrophe. Because what I've learned, and I used to work with a Dr. Patel, and you know, we were cool. This dude was so cool. We would talk about stuff. And I, once again, I am not risk averse. So I got, I got, I have a mouth that says stuff that got me in trouble at work a few times. And I said, like, hey, Mr. Dr. Patel, you know, I hear this thing with Indian families, uh, arranged marriages. Did that happen with you? And he sat back and he said, yes. Uh, my wife, it was an arranged marriage. It was, she was promised to me when she was nine and I was uh, 11 or 12, I believe. And I said, how'd that work out? And he said, it worked out great. He said, and this is something that still sticks with me to this day. And it's, it's just like it made me it made me have goosebumps and shiver. He said, I had to learn to love my wife because I knew that I was going to be expected to love love my wife. And they had they weren't the typical Indian couple. They were very hands on, very affectionate. And if you spend a lot of time with Indians or other couples, you don't see that. So I knew that he really had great affection for his wife and he had to learn that. And they were married. They were a solid team. And, you know, and this is time, I was like blown away at that realization. And it just later on, I was able to use that when I was going through my stuff, when I realized that the mistakes that I made were based on the massive information gap. And so I made all the stuff. I was a fucked up human being because, you know, sometimes you think you're a good person. But the reality is, no, you're not. And the simple way to ascertain if you're a good person is the people in your life water seeks its own level it just does and as i was in that neighborhood in the wilderness in the chaos of my life i started to find beauty and this is one of the cases of beauty because after Lucy and I parted ways, well, I'm lying. We didn't part ways. She just disappeared and I couldn't find her. So I had met another little friend because, you know, I was a dude and I was a horny dude. And, I, you know, I'm sitting here sleeping with this crackhead, this prostitute. And I didn't catch nothing, nothing, not even nothing. I had all the tests and I was like, hmm, maybe I'm invincible. But I used a condom with the next one. So we're going out and... I knew she was had issues, but I didn't really know to the extent because I checked and I asked around the neighborhood. I was like, she's selling ass, you know, and it's like, nah, man, you know, she a little loose, but no, nah, she ain't selling ass. So that's what I thought. Now, here's the other part. We're going down the road and then one night I'm just like, you know, we're in bed and my stomach is like rumbling and shit because I'm hungry. And she's like, what's wrong? I was like, I'm all right, I'm all right, I'm all right. Because I only had enough money to pay room rent, which was due every week. I think uh, it was 120 bucks at the time. They included electricity, my phone in the room, and all this other stuff, which I needed since I had a computer. I needed the phone line. So she said, like, okay. So she gets up, does something, and she's gone for an hour. And she comes back with uh, food and some money. And I'm like, where'd you get that? She's like, oh, I just went and turned the trick. I was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. You just did what? She knew I was, so she said, I don't do it all the time, but every time, you know, money gets short, you know, I sell that. I'm like, what the, you know, I'm just blown away. I'm just like, wait a minute, I just came out of this, like, checked and no, I was like, you got to be kidding. Then she snuggled up next to me after I ate the food. I was hungry. I ain't gonna lie, I ate it. And as she uh, was sitting there snuggling up with me, I'm just sitting there like, this girl just sold her body to God knows what to get me food. I was extremely humbled. I mean, I just started crying because I know what, I mean, it was fucked up, 
It was extremely fucked up, but there was a certain level of beauty that she felt enough for me to do something so horrible to benefit me. So when that is the reason that I got like a second job, I didn't want anything else like that happening. And, you know, we kind of it was kind of hard because, you know, it was just like, yeah, I like this girl. But in times of need, she sells ass. I can't deal with this. And I talked to her and I say, it's cool. So I got a second job and I saw her and she gave me probably like 50 bucks. And I saw her one day and I had a check. I just gave him a check. I had like 250 and I gave her everything. I was like, here, you know, I don't think I can ever repay you for what you did for me, but here, you know, and she just hugged me and she said, thanks. I need that. And she was gone. <laughs> probably selling ass again. And, uh, it, it really left me wide open because my mind was blown. I, you know, just to give you a little background. I'm from Alabama, a very, very conservative state. I was a virgin when I graduated high school. I didn't deal with stuff like there weren't people like that in my neighborhood. They, everyone had a house. The, the poor people, they were poor, but they still cut their grass. It was it was a mind fuck. So I was sitting on the stoop one day and I was just sitting around looking at my world because that was my world. You know, I could say, well, no, I'm not part. No, I was part of that world. And I started smiling. Because I didn't know it, but I said, if you can survive this bullshit, you can get rich. And I didn't realize it until later on that when I said that and I said it with a smile on my face, there was no fear. There was no anxiety. I had faced some horrible fears and I was still able to smile. And a few years later, that happened. So the deal is. You've got these fears and it's scary and you're dealing with some bullshit. And I know there are people who are dealing with way worse than I am because the stuff I dealt with because I had my health. And I think, you know, the second most devastating thing was watching my partner die. So, you know, looking at that stuff. You face it, it opens you up and you deal with it. Now, for you, enough about me and my crazy crackhead life. You got to start saying this word. Yes, that scares me. For many people, that is an immortal weakness. That is scary. That is admitting that you're not good enough. No, it just means that you're a human. When you're dealing with fears, you admit, you accept, and you act. Now, the admission part, that's rough. That's, that's going to be really, really, really rough because living in the world that we live in to admit that you're frail, fragile, and you have fear running around in your mind. People look at you and just say, oh, that person's weak. Some of the strongest people in the world are the ones who can tenderly deal with their own fears. Because when you can deal with your fears, you can deal with the fears of others. That's why if you notice that a lot of mothers who are super compassionate they're not just super compassionate with their kids. They're super compassionate with everyone because they can deal with it. They have that high level of empathy, and you have to learn how to give yourself that level of empathy because, like I said, I really fucked up. I had to forgive myself. I mean, I just, it touched everything. It touched every facet of my life, and that's, I just had to like, okay, we're going to have to move on. We're going to have to move on so that, that admit Admitting it's, it's hard, it's crazy, you're going to struggle with that because when you start admitting that you're scared, it brings up other stuff. And this other stuff is ugly. Some of it's dark, some of it's kind of soggy, some of it's a little. And you got this because every time you admit for the one fear, you bring up this other stuff. So you may be dealing with two, three, four, five, six, seven other things. Because once you start this, you create this whirlwind, whirlwind of energy and disruption because the stagnant, negative, fear-based energy, it doesn't want to leave. It's comfortable. It's there. It's the devil you know versus the angel that you do not know. You're like, yeah, I'll deal with this. I'll deal with this. So once you admit, then it's like you have to accept. I have to accept that was a fucked up person. I had to accept that I did the wrong thing. I had to accept that I made some very poor choices. I had to say this out loud. And I, I wrote this down in my little journal because when I was going through my divorce, 
I was so broken as a person, I joined a therapy group. And it was like, you know, it's about six guys. We'll sit around and we just bitch because we're all broken. We're all hurt. We're all pissed off. And in that space, there was this lady. I cannot recall her name. And she was like a temporary counselor. And she was like, Patrick. You know, a lot of you know my first name is Patrick. And he's like, Patrick. And she put, and she's short woman, right? Like 4'11". She put her hand on the and she said, look, it's going to come out destructively or it's going to come out constructively. It's going to come out. I know that you have a fountain pen and you like to, you have very good penmanship. You should journal. Because remember, it's going to come out destructively or it's going to come out constructively. And that's the way she spoke. She had that tonality. And I was just like, and that day I went home and I started journaling. And the journaling was extremely dark. It was like, all of the horror, all the bad things I wanted to do to my ex, I wrote that shit down. Hey, I'm a little, hey, I wrote all kinds of stuff. Little plans I had. I was like, yeah, she could trip. I mean, seriously, I was a broken little puppy. And writing that stuff down and seeing it on paper scared the shit out of me. It was like, who are you? That's what pain will do to you. That's what fear will do to you. It would make you do stuff that once you come to a clear mind, you were like, what was I doing? I think there are people in jail for murder that if they could have had like maybe a 30 second break to reflect, they wouldn't be in jail because they would have stopped. But when you were in that pain filled, angrily place, you can't you literally can't see straight nor think straight. But once, you know, once I put that stuff on the paper, I was ashamed. I was like, whoa, (laughs) good thing I'm in therapy and I burnt it because I didn't I mean, you know. You can say what you want to say, and I can put this here, but there's like no written proof, and I'm not going into too many details, but that was ugly, and like I said, I was ashamed. I had to resign myself to be a better person, and I had to really, really look at myself, so that was to act. I admit it, I accept it, and I acted. I started you know, writing is very powerful. We're going to do a lot of that in disruptive life coaching. So I sat down and I started, you know, I wrote out all the pain. I mean, I had pages and notebooks full of all the fucked up stuff that broke it. I mean, it was just going on. That's li- that's how I begin writing. That is how I begin writing that whole experience. And this is what I'm talking about doing stuff. When you, you do stuff, the benefits may not come to you until many years later. Because I didn't realize what I was doing. I was sitting there pouring my heart out on pain. And every time I wrote my journal, I felt better. I felt amazingly better. It was just like, oh, a little bit more is out. It was just like a little bit more, a little bit more. Then one day I was writing and there was no more pain. It was just like there was nothing else to write about. It was all out. It was just like, huh. Then I started writing poetry and I started writing short stories. And I was all this stuff because writing was my escape in the hell I was living in. You know, no matter what was going on, I can go to my room and pull out some paper. Get, and there was this store called Binders and over by Lindbergh. It no longer exists because they tore that whole complex down. And they had these, I saved up and I spent out. One of the members of the boarding house, his name was Lucia, actually worked at Art Light. So he hooked me up with some nice fountain pens. I had my nice stationery and I would sit there and I would write. And if I messed up, I would ball everything up and throw it in the trash and start all over because I had this perfectionist thing going on, which I currently don't have anymore. And it, it saved me. It saved me. So the act of dealing with my fears saved me. I didn't become an alcoholic. I've never really, I've never been high. And this is, you know, some of you are going to laugh. I've never been drunk. And I know that people are going like, Glendon drunk, that shit would be funny. Probably would be, but I, I've never been drunk. And I've never tried marijuana, coke, and none of that stuff. I've never, you know, I'm an extremely straight laced person in some aspects, but that whole experience, as ugly as fear based as it was, as terrifying as it was at times, I look now and go, wow, it was one of the best things to happen to me because I was forced to reflect on my life choices in a way that no one can make you. You, you, I just, I mean, I was literally stripped of everything, stripped of my position, stripped of my money, stripped of where I live, stripped of comfort, stripped of sanity. And I really had to deal with a lot of this stuff. So that is what got me from being a guy that worked in Northside Hospital, that worked at a coffee's gym, was living this suburban life 
that fell into the middle of one of the worst ghetto neighborhoods in Atlanta to the guy you know today. That is the process. And with all that horror and crazy stuff, I developed a reserve and a resolve that, you know, you'll see me lose it on YouTube because I'll see something and I'll just react. But the things that used to bother me that took months for me to resolve, it's a matter of minutes, hours, and that absolute worst days, maybe two days. I haven't had anything that has bothered me to the point that I couldn't sleep or just in years, decades. There was some stuff in the storage auction business, but it is not a normal part of my life. So you have to admit your fears. You have to accept them. And most importantly, you have to act because saying, yes, that scares me doesn't make you a weak person. In fact, it makes you very strong. Now, let's talk about your fear journal. You got to talk about this stuff to yourself. You don't have to talk to your husband or your wife or your best friend. If you choose to, and you feel someone that you can have that type of confidence in, okay. But I highly suggest that you do this alone because they're your fears. You own them. And when you're writing in a journal, this is not some no this is not a task to do before you go to soccer. No. Make time to write slowly and uh just be very deliberate. Be very, very deliberate. I've got deliberating <laughs> on there, and I'm going to leave it there, but to be very deliberate, because uh, this exercise will reduce your anxieties. And I know you're going, wait a minute, if I take my fears out of my head, it's going to make them worse. I'm telling you, it's going to make it better. I guarantee you, you will feel better, because one of the things that I've learned with the human thought process, there are times you may think that a crazy thought is actually normal, and because it's up there and it's in your mind. But when you extract it out of your mind and put it on a sheet of paper and look at it, you get a different vantage point. You look at it with like, whoa, hmm, hmm, okay, maybe that's not what I want. As long as it's just colliding up in your head, that's why mastermind groups work. That's why networking groups work, where people exchange ideas because you're pulling that idea out of your head and you're looking at it in the light of day with a different perspective. So those are definitely some of the things that you should really look at when you're doing this. So here's a few tips. You can use a notebook. If you want to use your iPad, fine, use your iPad. But you, I'll say a notebook and a pen. It's not about your penmanship. It's about getting it out. And set a time where you do this consistently. Definitely consistently. Now, here's the other part of uh, bringing home the pain. You got to do the shit that scares you often. What that does is takes the teeth out of it. The first few times is scary. Uh, I will tell you, my first 15, 20 YouTube videos was a scary little bitch. It was like, and it was just me in the basement. <laughs> there was no one around. I was like, and I was terrified. Then I did it and I did it. And I will give you another byproduct. I used to be terrified of public speaking. I have been asked to speak at a few events since the YouTube, the books. And I went to one and I got up and I spoke to people. And after it, I realized I wasn't terrified. I wasn't scared. I was like, where'd that come from? And it hit me. Every time I do a YouTube video, and that, this is one of the things. So people are like, your videos are too long. They're too long. I am training myself to give a speech. Every video is a reputation of me giving a speech. Most of my videos are off the cuff. I just sit there. It's like, well, we're going to talk about today, and I just drop it. So I'm training myself to be able to give speeches off the top of my head. That's a pretty awesome skill to have, I think. I didn't have it when I started this. I didn't have it. It wasn't part of me. If someone told me that, you know, you would go talk to a group of 50 people and be comfortable. I was like, yeah, right. It, it came from doing a YouTube video. See, there, there, this is the thing. People love to use this phrase. Don't work hard, work smart. I'm going to tell you this, and this is something I truly believe based on the evidence of my life, however myopic that may be. 
Many of the things that I've worked on extremely hard, YouTube videos, I am still getting better. I'm still working. I'm still shifting. The benefits in terms of byproduct have been numerous. So, yeah, you could do something a little bit better, strategy, outsource it. But if you do the hard work of developing it and haunting it, you're not just doing that. You might be haunting two, three, four, five, six additional skill sets while you're working hard on that one thing. So that's how you have to look at it, because you have to really think about your life in the way that you want your life to be. So part of that is doing the shit that scares you. And when you are doing something and you've got that tight feeling in your stomach and you are kind of shaking, this is what I did the first time I did a poem in public, I damn near shit my pants. I was It was just a bunch of friendly people that showing me love and I was nervous as hell, just nervous. And I, I did my poem and I got, and it wasn't that good. And they were like, they a little weak clapping. And I was like, okay, that's over. And I didn't realize that I needed to come back the next week and I just need to keep putting out, keep putting out and deal with, with me screwing up and not putting out good work because it was going to force me to put out good work because I couldn't keep showing up doing bad stuff. So just learn that you're moving. You're moving in the right direction. You have to practice fear fighting daily. It is an inquired skill. I used to be of the mindset that people were born entrepreneurs, that people were born this and As I sit here as a witness to you, someone who spent six years in special ed learning how to speak, someone who's mildly dyslexic, who makes his living from speaking and writing, you can learn. If you weren't born an entrepreneur, don't worry about it. You can become an entrepreneur. It's just what type of entrepreneur you're going to become, because I am of the reckless risk taking entrepreneur type, which I've really modulated over the years. Because there's some stuff that came my way and I was like, yeah, and I was like, "Okay, dude. No, don't do it. And it's not like I was afraid of the outcome. It's just I have other people depending on me. And that's another thing. If you're single, this is your time to do all kind of crazy stuff. Whatever is your time, because once you get a family, it's a different ballgame. So understand. You have to practice fear fighting daily. You you have to. And the thing is, luxuries once tasted become necessities, right? So you start practicing fear fighting daily. And then you get that good feeling when you start moving in the right direction and you start experiencing success. It becomes a habit. It becomes a good, it becomes like your crack. So you go from this thing, that I don't want to do this, and Glennon is just crazy. Then you start looking forward to it because you see benefit. Remember, this is a long-term process. This is not microwave uh, process. Depending on where you are with your fears, where you are in your life, how well you know yourself, you might get instant results. But I'm going to say probably not. So this is what you do. Dedicate yourself for a minimum of 30 days to the process, no matter what. Don't care if you're sick. Don't care if you got boogers coming out of your nose. You get your booger sick self up. Sit at the desk and you write about your fears. Um, Just know that there are no excuses for not doing this. You have to hold yourself accountable because when you do this, you develop a new habit of completing things that you start. That's what I learned. Uh, I'll give you something really quick before I part. This is going to sound crazy. Uh, Whenever I date someone and once again, this is rough and raw. I separate women into two classes. Either I'm just going to fuck this chick or she has potential. Now, for me, I don't act differently in the beginning because I'm typically going to have sex with a woman very quickly. But how what, what goes on with someone with that I see that can be in my life for a long time? So when I'm fucking, we don't go out. And, you know, I may do this because I learned that once again, I learned the technique on how to do that. And it's just kind of crazy. But I'll do the other stuff like meet someone that you really care about. You see potential. There's a lot of similarities. I just come out and do all kinds of stuff. Uh, The woman that I'm seeing now, she was shocked. I was in uh, out doing some stuff 
and I saw these shoes and I was like, wow, she looked good. And so I just picked them up and, you know, I got them and she came over and she's like, you bought me. She couldn't believe it. She was like giddy. She, she said, no one's ever done anything like that for me. So if I hit that feeling once again, because I've dealt with my fears, you know, I'm a divorced dude. You know, I understand. And I will also give you this, the 99% rule, 99% of the people that you meet romantically are not the one. Many people become disenchanted, disenfranchised, lose their mind. Oh, God, I'm wasting my time. No, 99.0% of the people meet are not the one. So you're experiencing a expected outcome. And people are getting upset and pissed off over expected outcomes when they should be enjoying themselves. So that's how I deal with the fear. And like I said, I love really hard. And, you know, there's some uh, women that will attest to that. And that's part of dealing with my fear, because, see, this is the thing. And like I said, this, this is a place where I let my hair down. Like, I'm a hopeless romantic at heart. And people like the guy on YouTube and talking about fucking chicks before you. Because, see, once again, the 99% rule. I'll give you this really quickly. I had a friend. We were not romantic. She was telling me about this wonderful date that she had. And she talked about the date. She talked about where they went. She talked about the, the atmosphere of the restaurant. And he did like a three-part date, which is very classy. I've done it. Like that three-part date is where you go somewhere for dinner, you go somewhere for drinks, then you go somewhere else for dessert. That usually blows a lot of women away. So he did that and it blew her away. And at the end of her conversation, I said, so what was about the guy? Oh, that's not going to work. But the date was awesome. (laughs) I was sitting there like, oh my God, Daryl. You, I mean, seriously. That's the thing. So I was just like, I just like, you know, you can be a guy, you can give a woman an awesome date, but if she is not interested in fucking you, the date probably is not going to sway her. Even though she's on the fence and may like pull her over and you might get some, you know, date pussy. But if she's really not feeling you and she, what she's doing is considered giving her, giving you a chance by allowing you to take her out and spend your money. <laughs> She, you ain't the one that you're in that 99, 99.99% with her and doing this, working on myself. I know when a woman's really interested in me and I know when she's really not, I know, I don't care what they say. I don't care how, smile, how much they, I know I can feel it. And going through this process of dealing with your fears, you open yourself up spiritually. Now, you know, this is where we get a little weird. I can walk up to people and just look at them. And if I get a feeling, it doesn't happen with everyone. I can say, oh, you're an artist. Oh, you're an attorney. Oh, you're, and be just with stunning accuracy and just like, how do you know that? You goof face. I was like, I've never seen you before. That came from dealing with my fears, dealing with myself, talking to myself, and going through this process. What I'm saying is, you can do this stuff too. This stuff is like, it's not like I'm super special. It's just I went through so much shit that I had to deal to deal with that I developed myself on a higher level, more so than I ever knew because I never really thought about it until I started doing the Hustler Mindset Project. I never had, I never really thought about it. You know, I, I consider myself of average intelligence, average looks. And um, I'll tell you, the girl I'm dating with is absolutely gorgeous. And that's been a common frame. And I want, you know, the dudes are interested. I may accelerate that because at some point that will come into the uh, hustler mindset thing. Because when I put up, I was going to teach dudes how to date. We were like, yeah, you're going to take me. I'm like, no, you don't want to hear this. Because essentially, in a nutshell, I'm going to teach dudes that the best way to get the best women is to become the best man you can be. So it's a long term process also. When I became better as a person, the women that ended my life became better to try to deal with external, you know, act, you know, external elements. Yeah, you can, you can fake it, but when you develop yourself from the inside out, the results are magnificently massive. So that's something to think about. And also, you'll learn in this process that not knowing what to do sometimes is human. People freak out. I don't know what to do. You don't know what to do at that particular moment by opening yourself up, developing yourself, answers to problems I have sometimes just drop to me when I'm driving or walking. And I'm going to teach you another little trick really quick. When you say, when you like, when you have a situation, he's like, I don't know what to do. Say this. 
calm down. If you have to take a few deep breaths, I don't care where you are. If you're in the store, whatever, do it. Take a few deep breaths and say this with a firm tone of expectation. I will figure out what to do or the answer will come to me or the answer will reveal itself to me soon. Say these things. Don't say, I don't know what to do. I'm fucked because you will train your mind to give you that outcome, that result. Say, hmm, I don't know what to do right now, but I'll figure it out. The answer is escaping me, but I'm going to catch it. Learn to talk to yourself that way is extremely important. It's extremely important. Only time I say negative stuff about myself is purely in jest. And just when I say it, I go back and mentally and say like 10 positive things because everything that you think, everything that you say, it all has weight and it matters. It does. So there's a lot of power in you that you don't even know about. I'm telling you this stuff. Like when we get into the other stuff with disrupted life coaching, you're going to be like, that boy is crazy, but I like him. Right. This is Glendon Cameron. I will see you on the good side.